All right, let's start again. Um, and the next chapter that I'm going to talk to you about, we got nine papers here looking at the uh, American Thoracic Society and the IDSA updated pneumonia guidelines. Kind of an important topic for us in the emergency room to know what these uh, specialty societies are saying for us. Um, I would point out that the last such guidelines came out in 2007, so they've been needing an update for a while. And so this is pretty much important stuff. I would also point out just in terms of the relevance and significance of pneumonia, um, it's the number three reason to be admitted to a hospital. Um, CHF is number one. And it's the number one reason to be admitted to a hospital for sepsis and for sepsis mortality. So pneumonia is a pretty important topic for us. Now, let's talk about who these guidelines are for and make sure we're talking about the right people. One, the guidelines are not for pediatrics. So you can decide where that line is. Is a 16-year-old uh, someone you would use these guidelines for or not? I think that's kind of up to you to a certain degree. But the main thing to realize is they're for community-acquired pneumonia. They're not for people with immunocompromise. They're not for people who you think might have PCP or, or HIV positive. They're not for uh, people who have recently been hospitalized. Um, or who have unique travel histories and exposures. And obviously, in today's day and age, they're really not for people who you think might have COVID. And so, understand who these guidelines apply to. Now, before we even get to the guidelines, I have a few caveats for you. The first caveat that I would offer up is, if you haven't ever read it, uh, Jeannie Lenzer, who writes for the British Medical Journal, journal, um, put together a nice piece titled, Why We Can't Trust Guidelines. And there are lots of reasons, but among the list of the reasons is many of the papers quoted or that are used there or members of the panel are industry supported. Two, many of the papers and things that are talked about that are used to make guidelines do not necessarily reflect the ED environment. Um, there <clears throat> may be grants and research and publications by the members of the panel which represent an intellectual conflict of interest, not a financial one. There's lots of publication bias. Um, and some of the studies that are quoted in some of these things as evidence are really not very good evidence. So there's lots of reasons to be suspicious of guidelines. In these particular guidelines, there's some stuff that if you actually read the original guidelines, and I have, that would make your head explode with regards to viral illness, but more about that later. So that's caveat one, be careful about buying into guidelines wholesale. Caveat two is, let's just acknowledge that pneumonia, and here in the United States, that's basically based on a chest x-ray and the clinical stuff that goes with it. You see someone coughing, sputa production, maybe they have a fever, maybe they have some schmutz, it's a soft call on the chest x-ray. Um, you know, the chest x-ray as a gold standard for pneumonia I think everyone in the emergency room knows that's not the goldest of gold standards. And then we have all these things that we talk about in emergency medicine. They get some fluids and then they plump up and they got an ammonia later on. Does that mean they didn't have an ammonia when you saw them? So there's that. And then if we want to talk about the developing world and the WHO and things like that, they don't require a chest x-ray for the diagnosis of pneumonia um, because in many of the environments they're talking about, it's a completely clinical diagnosis without a chest x-ray available. And so let's just jump to paper one, which is titled The Accuracy of Microscopic Urine Analysis, nothing to do with what we're talking about, and chest radiograph, yes, we are talking about that, in patients with severe sepsis and septic shock. <clears throat> and what they found is that reliance on the initial chest x-ray may be an unreliable guide to the choice of initial antibiotics. In other words, the chest x-ray is just not very good. Lots of patients didn't have it. In addition, there's other problems with the chest x-ray, which is there's high inter-observer inter variability between radiologists with regards to presence or absence of pneumonia. And there's high inter-observer variability between emergency physicians on the presence or absence of pneumonia. And so the chest x-ray as this concept of that's how you can tell who has pneumonia by finding an infiltrate Let's just all agree up front before we go any further on this, is it the gold standard? And I think we have to add, offer up that, you know, brass at best is what the standard we're talking about. Which leads to another question that's coming up a lot now and certainly been relevant around COVID, 
which is what's the role of the CT scan in the diagn diagnosis and management of pneumonia. And many studies previously have shown the chest x-ray looks negative and the CT has been positive. And I certainly have seen several COVID patients for which this was 100% true. But it's maybe true in other non-viral um, infiltrates and, inf and uh, infectious diseases as well. And so when you find a CT-only pneumonia in a patient who you clinically suspected pneumonia, but the chest x-ray is negative, which one do you think is right? The chest x-ray that goes against the clinical flow H&P or the CT which supports the clinical flow H&P? I think the CT is probably right and we would all agree with that. The authors of the next study uh, found that CT scan taken as the gold standard, if you just give me that, we're gonna offer that up as a starter, revealed infiltrates in one third of the patients who had no infiltrate on x-ray. And it excluded infiltrate in 30% of those whose x-rays had been interpreted to show one. And so this is not an argument for saying that every patient who has an pneumonia needs to have a CT scan, but if there's diagnostic doubt about it or you're not sure where you're going or you're gonna base important decisions on this, it might be worth stepping up your investigations. Overall, based on the results of CT scan in this study, the emergency physician modified his or her probability of community-acquired pneumonia in nearly 60% of the cases. And it's like 400 total. Uh, 22 patients who were scheduled for discharge were admitted. That's a pretty important change. And 23 who were going to be admitted were ultimately discharged. And so in this second abstract titled Early Chest CT Tomography to Assist in the Diagnosis and Guide Treatment Decisions for CAP, the CT scan really far outperformed the chest x-ray and directly impacted treatment decisions. And then before we even get to the guidelines, which we're, they're coming, hang on, I'm getting there. The next question is what role, if any, does bedside ultrasound have in the diagnosis of pneumonia? And there are now a bunch of papers that say ultrasound's better than a chest x-ray. Maybe not as good as a CT, somewhere in between. And that uh, the sensitivity is higher. And if you know how to do a blue protocol, which is the lung ultrasound protocol, you can find pneumonias with reasonably high confidence and they can, and sometimes when they're chest x-ray negative. So maybe the concept would be if the chest x-ray is ambiguous and you or negative and you really thought they had a pneumonia, maybe the next step should be rather than jumping all the way to CT scan, maybe you should do an ultrasound in between. High sensitivity in around the 95% range, specificity not that high, I'd like it to be higher, 60%-ish. Um, and so, you know, these are kind of great if you want to do that and you're comfortable with it. And most of the studies that look at this here are emergency physician point of care stuff. So we've abstract three, performance of comparison and comparison of lung ultrasound to chest x-ray for diagnosis of pneumonia in the ED. And they found uh, that uh, you could rapidly assess for other etiologies of the patient's dyspnea and you could find pneumonia with pretty uh, high reliability. And abstract four here in this group is an Italian paper that looks at point of care ultrasound for the evaluation of acute dyspnea. And it was a prospective blinded observational trial with almost 3,000 patients. And their conclusion was that point of care ultrasonography is feasible, accurate, and a rapid approach to the dyspneic patient, allowing you to find not just pneumonias, but other potential causes of dyspnea, including things like a PE, a pericardial fusion, other things. And so we have this whole doubt when we're talking about pneumonia and these guidelines, that chest x-ray is not a great uh, place to start. And at the bottom of the page after that Italian paper is a nice little algorithm that shows um, that if there's no new lung infiltrate on an x-ray and you thought they might have pneumonia, you had clinical suspicion that was on the low side, that you could go to a lung ultrasound, and if that was negative and you had concern, then go to a CT exactly as I described to you. So I think that's worth sort of digesting. Um, so now, let's go to the actual guidelines and some of the things that they say, the um, IDSA and the American Thoracic Society. And I'm gonna preface each one with a question and say what the guidelines say is the answer, and then we can discuss what the quality of evidence is at the current stage of time. And obviously these are expert recommendations. They're not necessarily strictly evidence guided. And so you gotta have one, some cynicism about that. Um, and let's talk about them, let's do the question. So question one, in adults with community acquired pneumonia, remember we're not talking about all the other stuff. 
Should gram stain and culture of lower respiratory secretions be obtained, be obtained at the time of diagnosis? Uh, and the answer is, um, as almost every emergency physician knows, in general, no. That chasing sputums is not really a good idea and that mostly you don't find anything that's useful. And particularly nowadays with COVID, no one wants you to go chasing sputums. It would be a really bad idea. In terms of who they say, yes, you should do this, and it's worth noting this, when should you do gram stain and culture, um, particularly if you can access them via an ET tube, are intubated patients. Um, if the patient has empirically been treated for MRSA or pseudomonas, so those you'd like to know and you'd like to know their sensitivity because they're battle-hardened organisms. If the patient was previously uh, treated with either of those pathogens and was the patient recently hospitalized and on parenteral antibiotics for 90 days where you might suggest something weird might be growing there. Those are the times to go chasing sputums, but in general, the answer is no. And there's no good evidence to support these recommendations that you should do it in these other groups, but I don't think they make you know me particularly full of angst. I don't mind chasing after sputums, particularly when someone's intubated or they got something unusual going on. Knock yourself out. Next question. In an adult with community-acquired pneumonia, should blood cultures be obtained at the time of diagnosis? Now, we all know that the infection is in the lungs. So why would you look in the blood? It's like, hey, they have pneumonia. Let's get a skin culture. Um, no, it's not going to be there. There are very few infections where blood is the place you're supposed to look first. But in any event, the sepsis guidelines are going to require you to get blood cultures on these people before giving antibiotics. And so while the blood cultures are exceedingly low yield and have significant cost, um, the answer is you need to get them. So this question's largely been co-opted by the CMS SEP1 core measures that require all patients being admitted with severe sepsis, including those with pneumonia, to have blood cultures drawn. From a strictly pneumonia point of view, the guideline recommends blood cultures in anyone admitted and blood cultures in anyone with severe pneumonia. All right, there you go. Next question. In adults with community-acquired pneumonia, should Legionella and pneumococcal urinary antigen testing be performed at the time of diagnosis? And so, obviously, you should have some idea that you think that Legionella might be present. So they say send Legionella urinary antigen if there is recent travel or a suspected outbreak. Send both in people with severe pneumonia. So they want you to get everything in someone with severe pneumonia. Um, and these are weak recommendations with low quality of evidence. <clears throat> and obviously, sending Legionella um, urinary test antigens on everyone being admitted to the ICU is not likely to yield many positive results. And of the positive results that it yields, you, you might posit that some of them would be false positives because the incidence overall is so low. Question, next, in adults with community-acquired pneumonia, should a respiratory sample be tested for influenza, so swabbing the nose or pharynx, at the time of diagnosis? And for those who test positive for influenza, who should be treated with an antiviral? So, <clears throat> in short, these guidelines and the 2018 IDSA influenza guidelines are all in when it comes to this. They want you to do this, and the summary they say is, when influenza virus is circulating in the community, flu season, you should test all CAP patients, all community-acquired patients, pneumonia patients, all patients admitted to the hospital with any respiratory illness. Wow. And all admitted patients with CHF and, or CAD exacerbations, even if they are afebrile. Whoa, that seems really overly broad. Uh, but those are the recommendations. So if you want to be doing uh, influenza testing, have at it. Note, this is just influenza testing and maybe RSV if you have those on a combo, not the broad-based molecular panels uh, referred to as a respiratory viral panel with 10, 12 items on them. This is just the flu testing. Um, <clears throat> and then who should you treat with an antiviral? All community-acquired pneumonia patients who test positive, and this is the part that really makes my hair stand on end, regardless of the presence of fever or the duration of their illness. The, that line occurs repeatedly through the guidelines. And all admitted patients who test positive should be 
treated. So regard, like you all know that when you start talking about Tamiflu and things like that, you need to get it early. And when you do treat it early within the first 48 hours, what do you get? You get maybe a day's benefit in symptom decrease, maybe something like that, if you believe that. I'm not a huge believer in that. Um, there's a lot of controversy around the original data supporting the usage of Tamiflu. But anyway, if just, let's posit you believe it. Um, but that's a pretty low yield to recommend the treatment of huge swaths of the population. So the IDSA guidelines and the ATS guidelines really go whole hog for treating patients with Tamiflu um, regardless of the duration of their illness. And in some cases, they say regardless of the presence of fever. Next question, in adults with community-acquired pneumonia, should a serum procalcitonin, along with clinical judgment, be used to withhold antibiotics? In other words, their procalcitonin's low, can't be bacterial, don't give them antibiotics. And they say, don't, please don't do this. They say that the PCT, using a variety of cutoffs, has had reported sensitivities for bacterial infection ranging from as low as 11% to as high as 100%, but the median sensitivity is around 70%. This is not adequate to determine who gets antibiotics and who doesn't. And they state, quote, our conclusion from this analysis is that physicians should be strongly advised against using low procalcitonin levels to withhold antibiotic treatments for patients with community-acquired pneumonia. That's different from following them to see if you could decrease it later on, decrease, uh, stop the antibiotics later on, but certainly don't decide whether to give them antibiotics up front based on the procalcitonin level. And abstract five is a procalcitonin paper. It's a multi-center, non-inferiority, randomized trial called the HITEMP study. And the HITEMP study, which came from December 2018, um, found that if you used a procalcitonin less than 0 0.5, pretty commonly offered cutoff, uh, had a sensitivity of 0.52 for confirming bacterial infection. That's not good enough. And a sensitivity of only 0 0.43 in confirmed um, or suspected bacterial infection, if you had the suspecteds, and that in heterogeneous populations, the accuracy of the procalcitonin in diagnosing bacterial infections was pretty poor. And so this is a sort of a, a nail in the PCT for the initiation of antibiotics in any event. And then just before I leave the procalcitonin topic, um, Again, a reminder that these guidelines are not for peds. So the pediatric group has a much stronger belief in the utility of procalcitonin testing, looking for bacterial illness, serious bacterial illness, which would include pneumonia in kids. Um, and so that is not addressed here. These, these are specifically not to be applied to pediatrics. All right, next one. What is the role of clinical prediction rules compared to clinical judgment to determine the need for admission versus discharge, as well as optimal admission location, i.e. step down unit, et cetera, for care. And so that takes us into the CURB score, CURB 65, which the residents like. And then because I'm an old timer, I like the port score or the fine score or the pneumonia severity index, that those are all the same thing. And the pneumonia severity index, um, I, I like better because it has a little more stuff in it. It has more detail. You do need to have an app to calculate it. It's been better validated prospectively. On page 276 in your chapter, if you're looking at it, there's the whole scoring system uh, mapped out for you. There's a couple places uh, that you can look at that are kind of worth noting. The first thing I'll point out, there's no role for the height or lowness of the white count in here. I do get a little more alarmed about the severity of disease if the white count's 32,000, for example. So that's not in there. Um, it also does have in there, though, the low sodium. And we know that any kind of pulmonary process can cause sort of an SIDH-like phenomenon in low sodium, and that's relevant. And then it also has in there congestive heart failure, which gives you plus 10. And a lot of patients with pneumonia who have underlying congestive heart failure their congestive heart failure might get substantially worse. And in some cases, I feel this plus 10 is an underestimate 
of what needs to be considered. So if the pneumonia is substantially worsening their CHF and making them more like acute pulmonary edema, I don't think there's any question you're admitting them and bringing them in, but I sometimes wonder that the 10 points given there might be adequate. Now, the CURB 65 score is listed on the next page for you, and when you compare them head to head, and that was done, Abstract 6, I think, is a pretty important paper, which shows why the old timer, like me, who likes the pneumonia severity index better, um, even though it's more complicated than CURB 65, here you see them head to head, prospective comparison of three validated prediction rules for prognosal community acquired pneumonia, and pneumonia severity index and the CURB 65 are in there. What they found is that the pneumonia severity index had a higher sensitivity and somewhat higher negative predictive value, so better at both ends uh, than either CURB scores. The more complex pneumonia severity index has a higher discriminatory power for short-term mortality. I really care about that. Defines a greater proportion of patients at low risk, so I can send people home. I really like that. And a slightly more accurate in identifying patients at low risk than either of the CURB scores. So to me, I know a lot of uh, residents out there prefer and have been, you know, walked into their world learning CURB scoring, particularly CURB 65. But I remain a pneumonia severity index guy, and here we have some head-to-head -head, um, comparison, and the pneumonia severity index was better. So there you go. So get that app, put it on your phone, use the pneumonia severity index, or you can look it up in about two seconds. It'll take you about two seconds to look it up. So summary recommendations to decide on admission versus discharge. They like you to use the pneumonia severity index plus clinical judgment. If you're worried about the patient, these are guidelines only. If the patient worries you for any particular reason, don't send them home. And again, remember, they're for community-acquired pneumonia, not for immunocompromised. Not for someone, for example, who had a viral illness three weeks ago who's now febrile again where you're worried about something like MRSA. Not for someone who's an IV drug abuser where you might be worried logistically for something like pseudomonas. It's for community-acquired pneumonia. And the next recommendation is on deciding on the ICU, any patient with severe pneumonia plus clinical judgment should be used to put them in the ICU. And I think the CURB score and the pneumonia severity index both work here, but I think the pneumonia severity index is better. All right, so we're moving along. The next question in the guidelines, what do they say? In the outpatient setting, which antibiotics are re recommended for empiric treatment of community-acquired pneumonia? Again, not any of the immunocompromised, not any of the weird stuff. By the way, I just have to say, under immunocompromised, you frequently ask, are you on steroids? Do you have some immunocompromising illness? Do you get chemo? People sometimes forget to ask about the new monoclonal antibody drugs, the DMARDs that are used. So right, DMARDs, the, these monoclonal antibodies come in the checkpoint inhibitor group, which is for cancer. They're less immunocompromising than the other ones, which you see advertised on TV for psoriasis and arthritis and all these other things. But those monoclonal antibody drugs make you immunocompromised. And why do I highlight this? Because patients, you can look at their med list and it's not on there because they get it as an injection every two months as an outpatient. So remember, to those people are not for usage in this group. Okay, but what antibiotics should you give someone who is in a community acquired pneumonia? No, no special categories about it. And the outpatient antibiotic recommendations are amoxicillin, a gram TID alone, or doxycycline um, with front end loading alone. If they have comorbidities, heart, lung, liver, renal disease, diabetes, cancer, alcoholism, or asplenia, then you should use amoxicillin, uh, sorry, augmentin plus azithro, or a cephalosporin, or a respiratory fluoroquinolone, with the proviso that you pay attention that the respiratory fluoroquinolones have moved down because of the multiple black boxes associated with their usage. And really, the current thinking with regards to fluoroquinolones is, is you should only use them if there's no alternative. So if you're cornered at a respiratory fluoroquinolone, based on their allergies or other problems that would prevent them from taking the other regimens. I think you can go there, uh, but it certainly wouldn't be something I would be doing as a first choice in any patients. Next question to be answered by the guidelines. In the inpatient setting, which antibiotics should be used and are recommended for empiric treatment in patients without risk for MRSA or pseudomonas? So again, we're holding those out. 
someone who had a recent viral illness and now had a well period and is now febrile with a pneumonia, you've got to worry about MRSA in those, the post-viral pneumonias, those are not included. But in the, in the absence of those kinds of things, for a non-severe um, admitted patient, ceftriaxone plus azithro. You can substitute other cephalosporins. Um, you can substitute the azithro with doxy. And finally, we're back to the respiratory fluoroquinolones. But it's dual drug coverage for people being admitted. And there's, um, they specifically say for severe pneumonia, um, no monotherapy um, should be tried. And for the sicker patients, you can use ceftriaxone or azithro. Now, next question. In the inpatient setting, should patients with suspected aspiration pneumonia receive additional anaerobic coverage? A lot of people would throw some clindamycin at them. And their summary recommendations is there's no need to change antibiotics if aspiration is suspected. If you're worried about a lung abscess or an empyema, you might change that up. But if it's just pneumonia, community-acquired pneumonia, or aspiration pneumonia without evidence of those things, then you don't need to do it. And in Abstract 7, small study looking at severe aspiration pneumonia in institutionalized elderly, so long-term care facilities, found that anaerobic anorism, an organisms were only isolated in 8% of the patients. So it's still not mostly an anaerobic organism disease. And even among those in who anaerobic organisms were found, six of seven patients initially treated without anaerobic, anaerobic coverage responded to therapy well. And so based on this paper, number seven there, um, they say go ahead. Now the crude mortality was 33% for aerobic organisms and 36% for anaerobic organisms in this group. That had a p-value of 0 0.9, so not quite significant. Um, the comorbidities did matter, and they were independent risk factors for bad outcome. So again, don't overthink aspiration pneumonia. You can pretty much sit pat unless they have an abscess or some empyema or they're getting a chest tube or you have unusual stuff going on. Next question. In the inpatient setting, should adults with CAP and risk factors for MRSA or pseudomonas, so now we are talking about them, be treated with extended spectrum antibiotic therapy instead of standard regimens. And they say, if your patient had MRSA or pseudomonas isolated from the respiratory tract within the last year, you should add appropriate coverage for that organism. So that means that if you're going to choose a cephalosporin, you need to have pseudomonal coverage. So ceftazidine or cefepime would be fine. Um, and if they have been treated with parenteral antibiotics within the last 90 days, you should swab the nose for MRSA, send blood cultures and sputum cultures, as we already addressed, and should otherwise not treat until the cultures come back. And so that's kind of an interesting, there's really no great evidence for this, and that's their current recommendations. Next question. In the patient inpatient setting, should adults with CAP be treated with corticosteroids? So this goes back to the sepsis literature, which I just reviewed. And as I said, you know, it's not the cleanest. We had a couple of papers with slight decreases in, and we're talking about stress dose steroids, 100 hydrocortisone, Q6 kind of thing. Um, and we have abstract eight, which is a, another meta-analysis. And they found in the steroid group, shorter time to clinical stability, shorter length of hospital stay, higher rate of hyperglycemia. We already talked about this paper. It's the same one. Um, and so the question is, you should guide this based on what the overall risk of the downside versus the upside is. And there was no ultimate difference in mortality here. And so, you know, that's kind of open. Um, and so you know, that's kind of a mixed picture with regards to the hydrocortisone. And the paper says, conclusions, adjunctive corticosteroids do not appear to reduce 30-day all-cause mortality in patients with community-acquired pneumonia, and a shorter time to clinical stability and, and hospital discharge seems to be offset by the higher risk of hyperglycemia and rehospitalization and hypernatremia as well. So there you go.
All right, next question. In adults with CAP who test positive for influenza, what should you do? Should the regimen include antibacterial therapy and, or just stick to Tamiflu? And they want you to treat both. So summary recommendations, treat with appropriate antibiotics any patient with pneumonia, even if they're positive for a viral pathogen. So they get the same antibiotics. And antibiotic discontinuation can be considered two to three days later in patients who tested positive only for a virus if they're doing well. So still start the antibiotics and your colleagues upstairs will determine what to do. And then finally, nine, viral infection is a paper on viral infection in adults hospitalized with community acquired pneumonia. <coughs> and what they reach for a conclusion is that viral infections are common in adults with pneumonia. Easily transmissible viruses such as influenza and RSV were the most common, and nowadays you would have to add COVID, raising concerns about infection control. Routine testing for respiratory viruses may be warranted in adults who have been hospitalized with pneumonia, and the multi-panel, this is the respiratory viral panel that you would do, and so there you go, and in this day and age, you'd add COVID testing. And so um, if that's where you're at, nowadays viral testing is warranted in these patients. In outpatient and inpatient adults with CAP who are improving, what is the appropriate duration of antibiotic uh, treatment? Most of us would say a week. Um, some would extend it out to 10 days. But the current recommendations are the typical antibiotic course for CAP is five days. Um, if they're not responding by day five, consider resistance or consider the wrong diagnosis or a complication of pneumonia. And this presumes normalization of vital signs as well as many of the other symptoms. So five days is what they're uh, holding out. And then the last page here has summary recommendations. And I think the messiest part of the ATS and the IDSA is the really heavy recommendations for Tamiflu treatment on all the admitted pneumonias um, who test positive, regardless of duration of illness, uh, regardless of the presence of fever, is pretty controversial, and the recommendations are fairly heavy on that. But the rest of the guidelines, I think, are pretty tolerable um, from us as emergency physicians. And again, you always have to remember who it is we're talking about. We're not talking peds. We're not talking about any immunocompromised patients. Make sure you're asking about monoclonal antibody therapies and other things that make them immunocompromised. And let's just run through them. And here they are. The key points and recommendations from here, from this chapter, and our sort of critical analysis is that even if the chest x-ray is negative, treat with the antibiotics if you really think that that's what they got. They got a good story, fever, sputum production, and consider doing an ultrasound. During the flu season, test broadly for influenza, and if it comes with RSV, so be it. Um, and and um, they want you to treat them regardless of the duration of the illness. Procalcitonin levels in adults should not be uh, used to withhold antibiotics with pneumonia that we got to. Use of a clinical prediction rule, and they like pneumonia severity index better than CURB, either CURB score. Uh, treatment for outpatient regimen, amoxicillin by itself, a gram TID or doxycycline, pre uh, preferably front-loaded. If they have comorbidities, change to augmentin or acephalosporin and azithromycin. Both severe and non-severe community-acquired pneumonia can be treated with ceftriaxone and azithro. You only need to change uh, to different antibiotics if they have some risk for MRSA or for Pseudomonas. In general, you don't need to worry about MRSA and Pseudomonas unless they've been present before or they've been admitted and received IV antibiotics in the last 90 days or have some specific risk factor. Treat all patients who have a cap with appropriate antibiotics, regardless of whether they test positive for a virus, when they're, and particularly if they're being admitted, um, you gotta treat those and then add the Tamiflu. And the usual course of antibiotic treatment for outpatients is five days unless they're not responding or having worsening symptoms. So there you have it. Those are our key points and recommendations. There's a lot of information here. It's only nine papers, but I think it's worth going through as this is day in and day out emergency medicine. We tried to keep it framed up with regards to reasonable clinical questions you might ask and see what the recommendations say. Not tremendously powerful evidence, but you should know what the American Thoracic Society and the Infectious Disease Society of America have to say about your practice environment and what you're choosing to treat these patients. So good luck with that.
and I recommend against reading the actual IDSA guidelines because you could have your head explode. Thank you very much and enjoy.